So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the session. It's good to see that uh, we are ready, that you are right at the clock. So as we join in, um, uh, please try to mute your mic. Um, so we'll have uh, my colleague Gade and uh, Jimmy uh, coordinating the session uh, with me. So thanks so much for joining. It's a great pleasure to see you all today and to see many new faces and other people whom we have interacted with uh, before. And uh, uh, it's really uh, a great time, uh, being that we are starting the World AMR uh, Awareness Week, um, you know, tomorrow. And we saw it fit to have this session just to capacitate us um, in the best way possible so that as we go about our wonderful activities, we're able to do it in the best way possible. And today we have with us our esteemed guest speaker, that is Mimi Meles Brewer. So I'll introduce Mimi and... Uh, we chose Mimi uh, for this session because uh, she has had a very extensive engagement with, um, you know, with young people, and uh, she knows so much about the uh, about AMR and also other uh, youth uh, engagement initiatives. So I'll start by um, introducing Mimi. Mimi, welcome so much to the session, and just share something brief about her. Then we'll start the session right on time. So a few house rules, uh, please, as we go on, uh, please ensure that you are muted. And also, um, in case you have any question, as um, we continue, feel free to type it in the chat box. We will be monitoring the chat and we'll address all your questions uh, after the session. Also, if in case we have good time, we'll also uh, ensure that maybe we give a few people, uh, you know, to speak uh, their questions. And uh, so that's it. Um, thank you so much and welcome. So over now to introducing our guest. Our guest today is uh, Mimi Meles Brewer, I've, uh, I've shared before. And uh, Mimi uh, is currently a technical officer in the Awareness Campaigns and Advocacy Unit of the AMR Division at uh, World Health Organization headquarters that is in Geneva. And she's a trained public health specialist and medical anthropologist with 15 years of experience, including 10 years at WHO and UNAIDS, and five years with Advocates for the Youth. And in all her roles, she has managed various projects in um, Africa and uh, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And relevant to this webinar, she earned her PMP Project Management Certification in 2020. So thanks so much, Mimi. Welcome to the session. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, thank you. And over to you. I just needed to unmute. Thank you so much, Daniel, for the, the very warm introduction. Can you hear me now just before I proceed? Yes, we can hear you and we, we can hear you and we can see you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me today. Uh, like Daniel said, my name is Mimi Mellis Brewer and a warm greetings from Geneva which is where uh, I'm based at WHO headquarters. Uh, we are very proud of our mission to promote health, keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable. And I would really like to thank uh, Students Against Superbugs Africa for inviting me to speak today. Uh, this idea around skills building on project management uh, started with a conversation uh, with Daniel some months ago around youth engagement which is an area I'm very passionate about in, in global health and development. And I'm very aware of the uh, great work that uh, Students Against Superbugs Africa is doing to mobilize youth in Africa and using a One Health approach. So I really applaud you for organizing this webinar in advance of WOW. And um, I will just proceed to um, introduce the topic today. So we are going to discuss harnessing simple project management skills. As a former young professional myself, I know how important it is to work efficiently, make the most impact, essentially save as many lives as possible. Um, and of course, you know, showcase your work, um, best practices, lessons. Um, but this isn't something we, we just wake up and figure out how to do. It, it takes time, it takes patience commitment to acquiring these skills. And um, actually now I think there's many more available tools than when I started my career about 15 years ago. Um, I think it's really a, a, 
a great time to 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 review some of these tools with you. Um, many of you um, may be familiar with some of them, but I would like to just introduce the these, and then hopefully after the webinar, you can then be empowered to um, do more research, debrief with your team, discuss how these approaches could be incorporated into your work. Uh, so all, I also think see this as not just something for a while, but in your everyday work for the rest of your career. So I hope this will be all very helpful uh, for you. And before we begin, I wanted to start with a quote from Dr. Tedros WHODG, who said, left unchecked antimicrobial resistance will roll back a century of medical progress, damage the environment, interrupt uh, food production, cause more help people to fall into extreme poverty and risk global health security. So we know that AMR is really linked to many of the SDGs, not only health. And we have to remember this in every little task or activity we do, no matter how big or small, this is why we are here to help prevent AMR. We know that there are 5 million associated uh, deaths from AMR, AMR every year, and this is unacceptable. So our work should be focused on saving lives and saving our future. Um, I know that we're work, many of you are working across Africa, so I just wanted to highlight um, some of the, the key statistics around uh, AMR in the region. So we have 4.1 million people who um, are projected to die um, from AMR by 2050 if we don't act now. We also know that developing countries across Africa could lose up to 5% GPD, um, which is a huge economic loss. And countries with weaker health systems are suffering the most from, from this global crisis. And it leads to higher healthcare costs, longer hospital stays, um, increased deaths. And I think it's really interesting how in Africa, the, the median age on the continent is actually 19 years old, which um, I read in the New York Times, and um, they're calling it also the youth quake, which is, it can be very powerful because there's a lot of potential investing in young people. And it's even more critical, the work that you're doing to educate young people specifically uh, on AMR. So let me take a little bit of time to explain where we are with the World AMR Awareness Week before um, we get into the, um, to the, the, the project management um, component of the presentation, because I think it's really important for us to kind of start on the, the same footing around what the objectives of WOW are, which is to increase awareness, you know, of, and understanding of AMR, encourage best practices, avoid, um, to avoid the further emergence and spread of drug resistant infections. Um, to achieve this, we have four specific objectives. Um, one is to that we must make AMR a globally recognized issue. Uh, we know there's very low awareness of AMR around the world, and so we need to engage all sectors, human, animal, plant, and environmental health using the One Health approach. We must you know, raise awareness of the need to protect um, antimicrobial e efficacy through uh, prudent, responsible use. We must increase recognition of the roles that different uh, different stakeholders can play in tackling AMR. And we should also encourage uh, behavior change towards prudent use and, and send out very simple actions that can make a big difference. So uh, you are probably familiar with the quadripartite organizations. Um, it's FAO, UNEP, um, WHO, and the World Organization of Animal Health, WOA. And we organized two rebranding consultations in, in the past uh, year. You may remember um, previously the WOW was called World Antimicrobials Awareness Week. Um, however, we realized that we needed more of a focus on the resistance, not just um, antimicrobials. So we really wanted to embrace the concept of resistance in our messaging. Um, so what does AMR do? How does it impact our health, our lives? You know, how, um, you know, the fact that me medicines will stop working if we don't act now is a really critical message. Um, and we can also speak to the importance of antimicrobials, but we, we want to focus on the resistance um, 
specifically and make that central to the, the WOW campaign. So just to elaborate a little more, and you can read this um, after the webinar, we have a meeting report on the outcomes of these consultations. And um, it's quite rich, not around just WOW, but how to strengthen AMR awareness raising, um, more clarity around the World AMR Awareness Week, um, which is what it's now called. And we also have updated um, our previous campaign materials to reflect this. We have a new set of campaign materials. Daniel was uh, showing some of the videos, which um, are part of the package. And you'll see that we're really trying to socialize the acronym AMR, similar to how TB or HIV have been socialized. Many people know what TB or HIV stands for. They know the disease. They may not know what it um, stands for, actually, like the acronym, but they know what it can do to the body, how to, you know, hopefully they know how to prevent or treat um, these infections. So this will take uh, some years, of course. We believe that with AMR, it's not something that happens overnight, but it's a good beginning to begin uh, socializing it with the WOW campaign. And we also sent out a survey earlier this year on the theme. So you may have um, received this, the survey disseminated in, our, in three of the UN languages, in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, the findings were actually quite similar that one, we need to ensure we encourage collaboration across sectors to preserve um, antimicrobials. And two, that we need to emphasize the importance of infection prevention at the heart of the AMR response. So if we don't reduce infections, we will need to use antimicrobials more, thus contributing more to AMR. So that has led to uh, the same theme, actually, I didn't mention that, preventing um, antimicrobial resistance together, which you may uh, already be familiar with as you've been planning for the WOW, but I wanted to give you that background and also mention that the joint uh, WOW campaign guide is available as previous years as well. And um, you'll find key information, ideas to join and participate. Um, we mainly want to this to be a resource, you know, for any individual organization interested in um, organizing different activities, promoting on social media, having links to the, the facts, evidence uh, from the various quadripartite resources, you know, have that all in one package. So I hope uh, that's been useful to you. And uh, we also have, uh, which I encourage you to check out, the WOW 2023 website uh, on WHO's main website. We have um, many different events covering various drug-resistant infections, including HIV, malaria, bacterial, fungal infections, as well as the cross-cutting issues like youth, survivors, engaging the media. Um, you can log in and register for all the webinars that you're interested in, but I wanted to just spotlight two events. One is uh, organized by the Global Leaders Group, and this is a virtual event with, uh, in dialogue with uh, Prime Minister Motley of Barbados. That's on the 21st of November at 1500 CET, and it's a really great opportunity to engage on um, youth issues and the AMR response uh, alongside also WHO DG. And there's another webinar just after that that's called uh, The Voice of Survivors and AMR Awareness and Advocacy. And that will feature perspectives of survivors themselves. Um, and they are part of the WHO AMR Survivors Task Force. So that's also on the 21st of November. But all these details you can find um, on our website. And uh, let me just, having issues with clicking the slide. So thanks for your patience. Uh, now we have the Quadripartite Trello board. It's also available where you can retrieve all kinds of different communication products, the social media assets, what is AMR, what are antimicrobials, how can you get involved. Uh, we also have the resources per sector. So if you're interested in you know, the animal sector versus the human health sector, everything is, is there. So I encourage you to check that out uh, and promote it widely. And then I wanted to touch on some of our AMR awareness raising activities in general, because we, we uh, are working throughout the year, of course, and it's really critical for 
um, different stakeholders to understand the basics of AMR. What is AMR? What can everyone do to stop this global threat? And, uh, and it's important that we send clear messages on the concrete actions that can be taken, whether they're farmers or healthcare providers, parents, children, teachers, um, everyone has a role to play. But we did have uh, in 2022, um, some consultations as the quadripartite to ask partners, you know, where should we put our focus? Who should we prioritize? And uh, we also came up with another report you can check out on our website titled uh, Awareness Raising on Antimicrobial Resistance, Report of Global Consultation Meetings. It highlights the three top um, priority target audiences that we as a quadripartite will jointly focus on, but of course, each sector will have also additional audiences. So one is um, children, students, and youth, two is the media, and three parliamentarians and policymakers. And we were really pleased to hear so many partners emphasize the importance of children and educating both them and, and young people. And in response, the quadripartite is in the process of developing uh, toolkits targeted towards partners who want to engage these three groups. So we expect to disseminate these three toolkits uh, in the next year. We're currently working uh, or developing those. And for the youth toolkit, we held um, consultations with different networks like Students Against Superbugs. And it was really instrumental in helping us define uh, 11 essential tools that can be useful to engage young people. And, uh, you know, a lot of the issues that we discussed were educating, how to educate young people, how to uh, capture young people's stories, how to manage projects for you, how to raise resources for young, for youth programming. So a lot of different tools that um, we look forward to sharing with you in the next year. And then I also wanted to highlight um, an important initiative because we really believe that young people are absolutely critical uh, to engage in AMR. We believe that young people are agents of change in the wider society. They have the potential to break the generational cycle around misuse and overuse of antimicrobials. Young people are the current and future consumers, healthcare providers, decision makers. And we also believe that young people can be strong influencers and in advocacy to mobilize uh, support from governments and policymakers. So we have uh, set up um, two institutions. One is a, a quadripartite working group on youth engagement for AMR. And the working group is meant to guide our efforts to engage young people in the AMR response. Um, this group was formed through a rigorous process. We had over 400 applications received and now we have 14 members representing different countries, uh, different networks from the human sector, animal sector, plant, and environmental sectors. Um, we held an inaugural meeting uh, on the 5th and 6th of October in Geneva, and it was really instrumental in developing a joint work plan with key activities that we set out to do in, in the next year. Uh, so stay tuned for those um, updates on this initiative because a lot of their work will be engaging with you in different formats. And actually, they will be hosting a WOW webinar on uh, Friday, 24th of November at 9 a.m. CET titled Why Do Young Youth Voices Matter When Fighting AMR? So that should be on our website soon. And we encourage you to participate, learn more about their work. And um, the meeting report for that inaugural meeting will be out soon as well. So that's a bit on the Youth Engagement Working Group. And then the second institution that we've set up this year is the WHO Task Force of AMR Survivors. This was based on the need that AMR has a framing issue. Uh, there are a lot of jargons, technical explanations, and it makes it you know, a bit difficult for the public to understand um, the basic concepts. And what is often missing is the human stories due to several reasons, um, particularly for AMR, I think, um, especially the, the classification, because there are so many different infections that emerge as drug resistant, and we can't simplify it into a single virus such as HIV or TB. So the task force is meant to overcome this challenge and frame AMR as an issue, which is complex, 
affects people directly. It affects their families, their communities. And um, through a call for applications, we have now uh, 12 members with really uh, diverse, compelling stories. We also held a, a, an inaugural meeting in Geneva on the 10th and 11th of October. And one lesson we learned from the meeting is that if, um, we often portray the, the rare and devastating infections in, with AMR and people then lose sight that it can happen to anyone. And, and so it's really important to share these different stories um, it affects everyone anywhere at any age. And we also learned that we need to create an urgency to act. So using antimicrobials based only on the professional advice to improve um, prevention in our communities that can stop AMR. And this also has an uh, economic impact. So when hearing the stories of survivors, um, it's, it's really debilitating. It can require taking off school, taking off work for months, even years but we wanna showcase uh, the stories, you know, these stories without uh, creating the panic and, and really try to focus on the solutions on how um, we can help prevent AMR. So that's just a bit about the Survivors Task Force. Um, I can, that was a bit of an intro, really just to help you understand the journey of, of WOW. And um, I think we can proceed now to diving into the project management side. And um, in the interest of time, then I can just, maybe it's better if I go ahead. So then we have a lot of time at the end to really hear from you um, and your questions. So by the end of the webinar, I hope that participants can understand key considerations for effective planning, uh, for monitoring and evaluation of WOW projects and effectively documenting and disseminating you know, your results, your stories, and, and scale this up, harness collaboration, harness growth and um, development. So that's, those are the objectives. And let's go to the next slide. So this is just an outline of what I would like to discuss today. Um, and it's, it's really important for us to um, understand why is project management important? How can it increase impact in our work and uh, I'll share some key tips that um, will hopefully spark some ideas and, and discussion. And also I would love to hear practical examples if you have any to share that you, know, you would like um, advice on. And uh, starting with why is project management important? I would like to take a moment and hear from you. So maybe you can write in the chat why you think project management is important and Danielle, if you don't mind, maybe reading out a couple of the, the first few responses just to get a sense. I can't look in the chat, unfortunately, with sharing my screen. Yeah, sure, I, I will. Uh, so guys, let's uh, share. As I've shared in the uh, welcoming email, uh, the email that we shared before with you. Uh, so it's an interactive session. So please feel free to, let's type uh, so that at least we have an interactive session and it will help a lot in terms of augmenting our learning. Thank you. So maybe one minute to type, then I can start reading. Thank you. Okay, so as let's continue typing, guys, I can see great responses are coming in, so I can just start reading. So we have the first uh, response from Amos Lucky. So Amos says that uh, uh, project management is important for proper execution of AMR action plans. Thank you. Uh, we have Waktole uh, saying to hit the goal. We have Ellie. Effective project management is important because it's what sets the stage for successful and impactful projects. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, actually. Thank you, Amos. Uh, we hand over to you, Jean. Uh, it enables tracking whether the goals of the project have been achieved. Thank you, Jean. Uh, again, Waktole, to control the budget. Uh, Melanie says it helps to ensure that projects are completed on time and within budget, and they meet the needs and expectations of stakeholders. Angoni uh, says it helps to ensure that um, 
you know, projects are done on time within budget and good quality. Thank you, Ngoni, and thank you, Melanie. Thank you, I can see so uh, many responses coming in. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Will Broad saying that um, it helps to achieve set goals. Thank you, Will Broad. Uh, Marcy says it, can, it helps to ensure that we have value for money. Uh, Ellie, uh, to keep everyone accountable. Abel, to, for proper EMR planning. Frank, allocation of resources achieved desired outcomes. You high for accountability and progress. Al Hassan, with project management skills, they are better equipped to boldly organize EMR awareness campaigns. Uh, Melanie, it also minimizes risk, maximizes resources, ensures that everyone involved in the project is working towards the same goals. So let me just take two, three more, uh, then I think uh, we can hear from Mimi. Then uh, we have Will Broad, it helps, to, it helps in effective monitoring and evaluation process. Weissman, it enables objectivities and strategy in approaching the fight against the MR. And Esther, uh, for proper implementation. So thank you so much, everyone who has shared. I can see so many others coming in. I do appreciate. Thank you, thank you so much. We do appreciate. And um, we'll continue sharing uh, your responses as we go on. Over to you, Mimi. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm very impressed by the wide range of responses, but also very um, accurate. I think many people hit on the points that I, um, I'm just summarizing here. So, you know, you need to have a plan, but you need to have a process for dealing with issues as they emerge. And as a project manager, you want to make sure your team can set out and on what it aims to do to make sure your team is successful. And um, there's also a quote that I really like that uh, really has stuck with me. And it's uh, expect the best, plan for the worst and prepare to be surprised. Um, by Denise uh, Waitley. So I think by setting up the adequate mechanisms for project management, you will get the work done. You can handle um, the surprises. You'll be able to, to plan and be able to track, accelerate progress when needed, um, and also just be ready to deal with issues as they emerge so that you can reduce risks, but also have a plan to um, mitigate risks. I think all the answers that we're in the chat are correct as well. It's um, really important for, you know, issues like budgeting and um, tracking progress and, and yeah, just there's lots of really good responses. So thanks for participating. And we now will uh, just walk through the planning stage of, of WOW activities, but more generally some key tips for you. So uh, you may have heard of a project plan or, or a charter. And these are some of the key components of that. So as a project manager, you want to make sure your team can set out what it aims to do to make sure the team is successful. So there are the goals, which are um, more general kind of goals of the project, the longer term vision, I would say, of what you want to achieve. And then there's the objectives, which are more specific, detailed in terms of um, what you want to achieve. So they're linked. Um, we'll explain a bit more on objectives. And uh, the team is who is going to work on the project with you, which seems very obvious, but it's, it's really important to know the capacities you have to deliver on the work. Um, you also wanna consider the length, so how long it will take, what is the duration of the project. Um, the costs are very important because um, you need to really have a, a good estimate of what the cost may be because it will have an impact on what you can deliver on, what activities you can develop. And then there's a scope, which is uh, what is you know in the scope of your project, what is not. And this is really important to be clear so that everyone knows the scope and can plan accordingly. Um, there are also some key terms that may be helpful to define very clearly in terms of deliverables. So um, what can you say you delivered on by the end of WOW? Those are your deliverables. And then when planning in advance, you also want to think about your milestones. So what are the really critical points of time activities that really can advance your project? Um, and then also the tasks that are necessary. So oftentimes people overlook this, but what are the specific steps that you need to complete your deliverables? Are all of these tasks necessary? How can you um, compress your time 
So you want to discuss all these issues with the project team to make sure that you're all on the same page and you can keep your, your plans up to date. And there should really be a shared understanding of, of the work. So um, that's why teamwork is really important. You'll also want to develop um, beyond the project plan is a communications plan. So there are key steps to develop the, the communications plan. First, you want to review existing strategies and materials because often you don't have to create things from scratch. You know, you can you can develop them based on what your organization already has, other partners, and adapt. You can also, um, it's also very important to set your SMART objectives, which we'll discuss in a couple slides. Uh, third, it's important to identify your target audiences. Who are you speaking to? Uh, the content of your messages could be very different if you are targeting the Minister of Health in your country versus a group of children in a, in a school. And then fourth is establish your um, communication methods. So what channels will you reach them? Is it an in-person event or a virtual? Where will it be? Is this the best method to engage them? And uh, five is, is similar in terms of, but it's around frequency. So how frequent will you communicate with them? What timelines? Is this just for wow, or do you anticipate some follow-up or, or regular uh, communication? Six is assigning roles to team members because it's very important for each person to know what they're doing. Um, we'll discuss a tool and how to, to map this out shortly. And seven, document your plan and share it with stakeholders. So this is really important to make sure that not only your team understands how the communication will be rolled out for a while, but also the, the other stakeholders you wish to engage. You can also consult them before you implement the plan to make sure um, everyone's aligned. So I wanted to talk about SMART objectives. I think some colleagues may have already learned this, but um, hopefully this is a refresher for you because it's really important uh, before going into WOW to have some SMART objectives. Um, SMART stands, it's a very, I love this acronym because it's very easy to remember. It stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, um, or realistic, you can say, or in time bound. So you want your plan um, to be as specific as possible. So there's really little room for misinterpretation. You want your goal to be measurable. So how do you know if you um, achieved your goal? Your goal should be achievable. Um, goals that are too easy to meet, you know, may not motivate your team or lead to growth, but goals that are unrealistic can kind of demoralize your team and even strain resources. So it's really important to find the right balance. Um, relevant is, is very important to align with your organization's mission, vision, and uh, yeah, align this with the work that you're doing over the course of the year. So does this align with other projects you're working on? And I think the best idea is really support the organization's broader goals. So relevant is, is very important. And then time bound. Um, this may be quite easy if it's focused solely on wow, but generally you wanna have a deadline for this when you complete your work so you know when to start measuring um, your impact. So, Hopefully you can remember this acronym. Um, I do have two examples here of a SMART objective just to because examples are always very helpful. So by end of the WOW campaign or end of November um, 2023, 20 media professionals will be trained in my country to adequately report on AMR with evidence and human stories. That's just one example. The second example, um, could also be like by the end of the WOW campaign, 2000 young people will be reached through AMR workshops in schools and they'll have a basic understanding of AMR and how to take action. So you'll see here, um, we, we look, we talk about who will be reached, what change will be received, uh, what time period and where, so what location. So I hope that was a good introduction. Please feel free to Google and <laughs> research some of these um, tools a bit more. Uh, I wanted to also introduce uh, SOCO. It's another acronym that you may have been familiar with in the past. If not, um, it's called the Single Overarching Communication Objective. 
And this is a tool used to create specific messages for your audience. So the first step is to state your key objective, um, your key, um, the key point you want to communicate. The second step is thinking about what are the three most important facts you need an individual or a group to understand. Uh, the third step is who is the main audience or the population segment that you would like this message to reach? And then who is your secondary audience, which is the group that influences your primary and your main audience? Uh, and then the fourth step is what is the one message or action someone needs to understand? Uh, and this is your communication objective. So uh, for example, one of my SOCO objectives, which I actually developed in a, in a WHO communications training a few weeks ago, um, is that the change I want to see is that countries should take action to ensure um, AMR prevention for children and adolescents is taught in primary and secondary schools so that they are empowered to reduce you know, the spread of uh, AMR infections. So essentially, that's just to give you an example, but essentially your SOCO is the change you wanna see as a result of your communication. And then you can develop your key messages. Um, you know, For example, uh, prevention is key. We can preserve um, life-saving treatment through vaccination, through accurate diagnostics, uh, responsible use of antibiotics. Um, you know, these kind of messages that you can tailor for, for your different, uh, for your target audience. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you can also look up the SOCO and it can be very helpful um, once you've developed your, your communications plan so you know who your target audiences are. And then it's a great framework to, to develop um, your communication objective and then some key messages. And then here is just some of our materials that I'm trying to introduce now around uh, the WOW. So you'll see this is part of the package that we've been um, promoting for this year's campaign. So uh, I also wanted to introduce the, the Rossi matrix um, because it's quite helpful to understand when you're working in a team, who should be doing what task. So with a Rossi chart, um, it's also known as a responsibility kind of assignment matrix. And it's used in project management to define team roles across uh, four categories, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And it helps clarify who does the work, who makes the decisions, who needs to stay uh, in the loop for each task, milestone, or decision. And it really uh, enables you to visualize the roles and responsibilities in a more um, granular level than kind of simple assignments. And uh, that way the team and the stakeholders know what's expected of them. It doesn't, um, it helps prevent confusion and um, enable success in your projects. So um, just to introduce the different uh, letters, the responsible party is the person who completes the task. So they're the one that is uh, responsible for the assignment. Uh, accountable is the person who delegates work and is the last one to review the task um, or deliverable. And, and so the, the responsible person may serve or report to the accountable one. Um, and it's important to have at least one person that's held accountable. Consulted is when every deliverable, um, it can be strengthened by review, consultation from more than one team member. Um, you can have as many people as you want consulted. Um, and that helps en enhance the impact of your project. Um, and it's great to have people who, you know, are experts in the domain um, and, and get them involved. So they're, you know, can be consulted at, um, on specific tasks. And then informed is when um, you're simply keeping them in the loop on the project. So um, they can get roped in, um, they can get informed, but not roped into different details of every deliverable. So uh, there's not really a maximum or minimum for, for this one. Um, but some people may confuse responsible versus accountable. So it's very important to be clear about that. Um, because the responsible one usually is driving the task, ex um, executing the work, and the accountable one is more outcome driven and is the one that reports on or approves the work. So uh, I hope this is helpful for, you know, you're going to be working in teams. I, I rarely see anyone working on their own on these activities. So hopefully you have people to 
support you and you can fill out this um, matrix to kind of make sure everyone's clear about the, the roles and their expectations. Um, I want to break it up a little bit because I know I've been talking a lot. Everyone's so patient. And I wanted to ask, uh, a present a scenario and you can put in the chat what you think the answer could be for a, a Rossi matrix. So um, I'll read out the question. X is part of a team that will work on a later step in your project. You need to tell, the, uh, tell X that earlier steps are behind schedule. At this point, which role is X being assigned? So what could be the answer? I will give you a minute. So it could be A, responsible, B, accountable, C, consult, and D, or D, inform. And then I may ask uh, Daniel, if you don't mind reading and seeing what the majority of responses are. And it's okay for people to not be sure of this. We can. That's a part of learning is to, to participate. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mimi. So yeah, I can see most people are uh, typing in a, hey, wow, it's uh, a blanket. No other, you know, with any other response. Okay. Um. Hmm, yeah, so uh, everyone has typed in a, okay, more responses coming. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, Daniel, is, are you going to check if anybody writes a different answer? Is everyone yes. saying okay? Yeah, we have oh, others coming in now. We have some mm -hmm. uh, two people, that is Isaac and Oluchi. They have written, they have answered C, that's for consult. Um, uh, we have a B from Fosca, thank you. Uh, we have B, so only B, okay, thank you. So okay. well, thank you so much, everyone, almost. Uh, uh, close to 30 responses, almost heading to 40. Thank you so much. And uh, so majority um, responded with A. Then we had uh, the second, I think it's B, then C, then um, a few Ds. Thank you. Okay. you? Thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate it. Uh, actually, it's interesting. The correct answer is D, inform. So for those who said inform you're correct um it's a bit of a trick question i have to say it's not easy to you have to read it a couple of times to understand but the reason why it's informed is because uh for the specific task um the project manager is basically informing x so that um that things are behind schedule so for this specific task they're in being informed um, because they're going to actually be involved later on. So you'll see in the beginning, it says um, X is part of a team that will work on a later step in your project. So that means that for this task, they're not, they're being informed and then they'll be involved at a later stage. So I know it's a <laughs> challenging one. I hope everyone understands that, but thank you so much for participating. It's really interesting to see um, how people responded and you can read more about the, the Rossi uh, matrix as well. And, and get templates on how to, to use it. Those are free online. So I wanted to also introduce another uh, tool, which is more at an organizational level, but very helpful for your network if you don't have a, a, a project organization chart. So um, this is really helpful to create buy-in for um, securing resources. You'll see for uh, reaching out to donors but it also brings clarity around who does what on the team and it sets expectations for the effort um, involved from individuals. So these are quite easy to produce um, and you'll see lots of templates online, um, but I think it, it's, it's very helpful to, um, to read about the project organization chart because it's a visual diagram that shows who is in the team, the role that they, each person plays, um, you may have heard of even the terms organogram or hierarchy chart or team structure chart. Those are all um, the same. So it shows the structure of the organization and then how um, their the power positions are at play. So who's reporting to who or um, the different relationships uh, between team members. So um, this is definitely something you can consider making for your 
for your project more generally. And um, you can look more, more into that um, after the webinar. So I also wanted to highlight the SWOT analysis because um, it's actually something I was working on the other day. Um, it's very, very useful tool um, when you're when you're trying to figure out also even in the early stages when you want to see if this is a project you want to pursue, um, you can look at a SWOT analysis, which you can probably guess it stands for strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And it's a technique for understanding internal um, and external factors that can have an impact on the viability of your project. So that you'll guess that the strengths and weaknesses are more on the internal side. So what goes on within the project, the activity, um, but then on the external side, what are the opportunities? What are the threats? And um, the strengths and weaknesses could be related to internal issues with, within the organization. It could be a project issues. Um, and then opportunities and threats are more external events, political opportunities, maybe a stakeholder opposes or supports what you're doing. So that could be an opportunity or threat. And I, I tend to use it um, you know, in groups, of course, that's something really important so that you're brainstorming together uh, on these different um, issues that you want to address. And um, also it's quite, uh, there's quite a lot of templates on that if you need more information. It's also kind of linked to a risk register, which is another tool that I use uh, quite a lot for risk management um, to really identify those potential setbacks within a project. So um, this really allows you to identify your risks, analyze your risks, solve the risks um, before they become problems. And uh, I think potential risks and uncertainties can be internal or external, you know, positive or negative, and it can vary as well in the likelihood of it. How likely is this going to happen or the impact it could have? Is it a very high, um, very severe or not so severe? So you wanna map out all of these um, different risks and uncertainties, um, which could also be uh, stakeholder expectations of the activity. So maybe you're doing um, a project or campaign and you're introducing a new topic and you're not sure whether the stakeholders will buy in or engage. It could be the budget or resource constraints and that narrows your scope. Um, it could be technical issues and it could be uh, external problems like the, or legal regulatory changes. Um, it could be political issues or even environmental or natural disasters that could actually impact your project. So um, this is just a template to, so you can see um, what, uh, how you could color code it um, and, and really look at Pay attention to the ones marked in red, for example, because they're either very likely to happen and or, and or very severe. So those are the ones you want to probably pay the most attention to because it can really um, inhibit you from achieving your the results you want to achieve. So um, that's the risk register. And then this is quite a popular tool, but I, I felt like it, it's important to, to raise is the Gantt chart because it's very helpful for project planning. So it helps you really track your project's deadline. And you will see, um, we actually created a Gantt chart for planning the WOW campaign at the global level. And you'll see there's the tasks and phases of a project. And then there's the bars where it will start. So you'll see in the beginning in green and then when it could end. And we also have, a, we can add milestones so that you can see, okay, this is when we're kicking off the wow. This is a key event or um, activity that needs to happen um, to plan successfully for wow. So there's lots of templates um, for a lot of different Gantt chart templates. And I think the online ones are quite useful because you can update your plans. You can, um, everybody can have the same uh, version at all times. Uh, and so that's that's the Gantt chart. And actually more generally, um, I think online tools are really helpful because um, it allows, you know, different stakeholders to come together on a specific platform. You know, you can, there are platforms where you can really create tasks together and everybody has access to it and assign work um, and, you know, 
send reminders that people need to meet deadlines. And I think this really has an impact in faster turnaround, you know, improving the quality of your work, making sure that people are complying to any guidelines um, that, that are important for the project to be successful. Um, and also, yeah, it leads to generally more improved uh, efficiency and um, management. And there's some examples of different tools at the bottom. I, and also this one is a Go Visually tool. Um, we, I mean, WHO does not necessarily endorse any specific tools, but we uh, would encourage you to, to Google and, and see there's Trello, there's Asana. Um, a lot of them offer basic accounts for free, um, but then you may have to pay more for additional features. So I just encourage you to look into that because of course costs can have an implication on whether or not you uh, use the tool. But I find those very helpful when, especially when you're working in a virtual space, maybe your team is not all in the same place. So uh, yeah, have a look at those online kind of tools and it makes it much easier um, to communicate with your team. So I also wanted to touch on teamwork because it is really important to work effectively as a team. And I have eight points here that are very valuable. I'll walk through uh, quickly uh, to make sure there's time for a discussion. Um, so it's really important to have clear and consistent communication across the team. Um, and this links to number two around really making sure you establish a clear and regular system to guide, to monitor implementation, um, you know, for specific tasks and activities, it might be a good idea to form subgroups that can report back to a larger network. Um, this can allow people to focus on their expertise or skills, you know, whether it's the communication side or the advocacy side or the technical side. So having those um, subgroups can be maybe make things more efficient. Uh, and then we have four, establishing a clear decision-making process. So that enables each member of the partnership to provide input. And um, it's really important before meeting to outline, you know, what are the key decisions that you, um, your team needs to make and how will you build consensus? So it can be through voting or simply discussing and, and reaching agreement to see if um, anyone opposes. And it doesn't have to be complicated, but it should be, you know, tabled as an important decision um, to move forward. In, in reaching consensus. Uh, five, rotating responsibilities as much as possible. So that really allows the weight not to fall on one person, but it can help um, you know, shift uh, responsibilities. Maybe one person's busy for a month and then another, so another person can take over. So having um, rotating responsibilities for chairing meetings or taking minutes, um, so, and then there's six, when conflicts arise, really it's important to address those directly and openly. You may want to have a mediator um, because this can affect us emotionally and uh, everyone's a human being. We have, um, we, we are impacted by the way we work with each other. So it's very important to address these issues and move forward with solutions. Seven, uh, build an internal communication platform. If you, um, you could consider the internet if you have one or Google Drive um, so that there is a shared space for, um, you know, communicating or storing your information. Um, you know, WhatsApp groups, I know, are very popular in, in the youth space. And then eight is identifying using opportunities for training, learning, sharing, and mo motivating each other. Um, I think this is a perfect example of a webinar that is doing that, trying to um, really help everyone develop their skills so that um, they're really motivated to engage in the WOW and, and other activities. So um, those are the eight kind of some key points I wanted to highlight in terms of teamwork. <laughs> I'm mindful of time and I, I do want to cover just a couple more things and then we can get into some discussion. Um, so I wanted to touch on um, monitoring and evaluating. So we'll just highlight a couple of things on this because it is really important and it even starts in the planning phase, but I felt like it deserved its own separate <laughs> set of uh, slides on monitoring because um, the monitoring is a systematic and routine collection of information um, 
from projects and programs, and it serves four purposes. So learning from experiences, trying to improve practices. Uh, you also want to um, look at the internal and external accountability of the resources and results. Um, you wanna take informed decisions on the future of the initiative, and you wanna pr promote uh, and empower um, beneficiaries of the initiative. So that's on the monitoring side while the project is being implemented, keeping in mind these four um, main purposes. And then the evaluation side is looking at assessing um, systematically and objectively as possible, you know, the completion of a project or program. Um, and evaluations can appraise data um, and information that make strategic, strategic decisions about the project in the future. So um, it's likely for a while that what, uh, this is likely part of your um, bigger project, which you may evaluate. So um, I think I wanted to highlight the difference because that can be often confused when we say M&E, monitoring evaluation. Um, so step one, tracking progress. How will you know if your efforts are successful? So um, there are some key um, tools and vocabulary I wanted to just familiarize you with. Um, so you'll hear uh, the M&E framework uh, looks at what we will, what will be measured. An M&E plan looks at how it will be measured, a logic model or frame, and it serves as a planning tool to help you set your objectives and how it will be measured. And those are tools then that have different types of indicators. Um, in the interest of time, I highlighted the process indicators because for a while you'll be measuring your activities and your outputs like the number of people who signed the petition you developed or the number of people who attended the advocacy training um, or who read an article that, or a video that you've published. Um, and of course you ha can have targets so that you're actually checking if you're on track to achieve um, uh, your objectives. And then there's means of verification. So what are the tools and processes you're following to collect the data to, is it through a survey? Is it through downloads on a website uh, that where the article is published? It could be anything you use as the source of your data. And then also there's the assumptions. Um, so what are the conditions or factors that will guarantee um, success? So um, success of any project. So those are just assumptions you want to make around, you know, whether um, whether you're you're reaching young people successfully during um, the WOW campaign. Maybe you're assuming that, um, you know, all the, the young people receiving the materials um, have a, a basic knowledge of, of AMR, um, which is probably not the case, but I'm just giving an example to kind of <laughs> showcase an assumption. So uh, we'll dive into a log frame just because it's a very practical matrix on how, uh, on your project's goal, on the activities and anticipated results. And then it provides a structure to help specify the components of a project and its activities. Um, and, and they kind of relate to each other. So um, it also kind of helps you identify the measures by which you're going to achieve your results. And uh, this is a very important tool to develop before you begin implementation. So um, it's actually something that should be part of the planning stage. I've mentioned that before. Um, so you wanna look at your goal, your purpose, uh, your outputs, the specific results that the project will generate. Um, the activities are like the tasks needed in order to achieve the outputs. And then you can write horizontally the narrative summary. So just a short description um, of the project objectives, the indicators, uh, the means of verification, the assumptions. So this is a very helpful tool you can look into. And uh, step number two is really important as well because it's actually assessing your activities and listing, um, not only listing the activities, but looking at how effective were they? Did I, are there any lessons that I can gather for the future? Um, sometimes people just organize activities and they forget about taking a moment with your team to think about what worked well, how this can be um, improved, whether there was any evidence to support the case that you know maybe it didn't work so well or any, any future changes you want to improve. So this um, example I have here 
is, uh, you know, you may be publishing an op-ed in the local newspaper and, you know, it was of good quality um, and the readers responded very positively, but then maybe the local newspaper uh, was not so popular and it was maybe not read by the audience. So for the future, uh, we can try to publish it in a more widely read newspaper. Um, you know, so practical kind of suggestions like that, you know, you could focus on, um, on uh, establishing connections with the widely read newspaper in advance so that more there's more readers. Um, so these are just lessons that you can gain to really make sure you're impactful in the future. And then I wanted to highlight um, the last tip, set of tips to showcase your results because uh, it's really important for you to promote your work, uh, make it visible, um, showcase best practices and help other people learn from what you're doing. So uh, I, I wanted to at least highlight a couple of slides storytelling because it's um, the oldest and most effective form of communication. Um, it's one of the most powerful tools that we can use because it's about sharing the real narratives, um, the most compelling um, stories around AMR. And I think especially for the younger generation, it's, it's really um, interesting to see, hear people talk about how AMR affects them. So um, I would encourage you to collect stories um, and you know, work with human AMR survivors, you can work with farmers, um, pet owners, they all show different perspectives of how AMR affects them. Uh, and this can be presented through various media channels, articles, photos, videos, um, podcasts. Each medium can give a new angle to the story. And we need to think of um, think about your goals, your audience, the platform um, that you're trying to use to captivate your audience and make it easily shareable content so that other people can popularize it as well. And um, I also wanted to emphasize the importance of working with AMR champions, whether they're policymakers, youth influencers, um, survivors, they can add a new perspective um, to the discussions you're organizing for a while. And um, I wanted to remind everyone to keep it simple, concise, easy to understand. And you may, um, you may understand it, but you have to think about your audience as well. So would they know what you're talking about? Would they understand it the same way? So think about it from, from that perspective. And then also for written documents, make sure that you're, you know, you remain a credible source. So make sure you're fact checking, um, looking at materials that are UN or peer review journals. Um, you can get someone else to, to review something you've written before it's getting published. Um, ideally, some a strong researcher or writer to kind of cross check your facts so that you know what you're sending out is accurate, evidence based information. So, thank you for listening. I I really didn't want to go uh, over time, but there's so much interesting content out there. It's really uh, helpful to um, to uh, to discuss that with you. Um, I did have a just a couple of slides I could share at the end. I do want to hear from you and see if there's any any questions you have. And then uh, I have a couple more slides at the end for wrapping up, if that's okay, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, um, Mimi, for that. Wow, very insightful uh, webinar and training. On my end, I've also really learned a lot. Um, so I can see we'll, we have uh, three questions currently at the chat. Uh, so thank you, Abdul Gafarias, who will uh, provide access to the recording. And I see, uh, you know, we uh, also hit the 100 mark and uh, I think um, we had planned for 100 people. So I think some people were not able really to join us, uh, just receiving some comments. So it's good that we had so many people uh, even above what we had targeted. And uh, so we'll share the recordings so that at least even those people who are not able to attend can also attend. Uh, can also listen in and also gain from you know this uh, rich knowledge. Um, so I'll start with a question from Isofu Ibrahim, and uh, Isofu, thanks you Mimi for the wonderful presentation. And uh, so the question is, what role will young volunteers be able to play in raising awareness in the society? Uh, in the society, in raising public awareness about AMR, and who will support them as partners and sponsors? 
maybe let me just read all of them together then you can address them uh the second one is from wilbrod with illiteracy levels of african uh the african continent how best can young people plan their awareness campaigns to ensure that everyone every individual is reached or is reached with the right information on amr and the third one uh from you high and so many young people have a ideas of crafting awareness in their communities are there existing plans or are there existing plans or efforts to support these ideas future future wise or currently so those are the questions uh thank you Ngoni, for sharing uh my profile and mimi's pro linkedin profile thank you and over to you mimi excellent thank you so much daniel for reading the questions and very, very, um, very good questions from the group. Um, I think I'll start with the one on literacy because uh, it's an easy one to address. I think I had a similar experience working in, in uh, Malawi some years ago on a, a project with young people and um, the, you know, illiteracy among young people in, in Malawi is quite um, high. And so one of the ways we were engaging them was um, through music, through art, because those are ways that, you know, and anybody can access um, through singing through, and also it's more interesting, it's more compelling, it's catchy. So I think, um, I'm sure lots of people in the room have experiences on how to, to work with artists and try to, um, try to um, form kind of partnerships with the kind of non-traditional groups um, aside from the civil society, because I do really feel like artists have such a um, interesting and unique way of um, gauging young people. And it's also way more popular. And I remember in, the, in Malawi, they were going around the country and doing a tour and visiting schools and making singing songs. And a lot of people were catching on to these messages. So um, I would really encourage uh, these kind of approaches. Uh, to make sure we reach the most marginalized youth because uh, it's not, you know, we don't want to put them further in a vulnerable state by not engaging them just because of lack of access to education or being in particularly in the rural areas. So these are all factors that um, affect, you know, young people's ability to um, learn and en engage in, in these discussions. So um uh, that's one question, answer to the, the question around illiteracy. Um, and then there were, the last one was around how young people are working in communities um, and what are the plans and efforts to seek um, guidance. And uh, I think generally, um, I, I do feel, I've worked with young people and youth organizations over the years, and it's uh, unfortunate how little resources are available to youth organizations um, because of you know the fact that they're young, because some of them are not uh, official uh, with NGO accreditation. There's so many different kinds of barriers. So um, I think uh, what we've been trying to do, at least as the with the quadripartite, is um, introduce some of the, the, the tools. That's why we're developing um, this youth engagement tool um, to help uh, empower young people to at least be able to um, seek out resources um, with partners to help uh, showcase their their programs and their results. And um, I mean, WHO is not a financing mechanism. Unfortunately, we provide technical guidance, and so we are very limited ourselves in resources. But you know, I think these tools and trainings can be, um, and hopefully, connecting you with other civil society groups. Um, working in this, but um, I think also I would encourage you to, to try to work with, um, and maybe you're already doing this, but working with partners in other areas in global health, because uh, I've come from working in, in HIV, where there's a lot more funding available, um, also in, in young youth health development more generally. I think um, positioning the work you're doing, uh, not just in the AMR as a siloed issue, but cross-cutting, you know, AMR is related to infection prevention and education and positioning yourself that way, because the broader you make your scope in terms of how uh, you present your work, the more easily it'll be to, to access funding um, and uh, 
you know, implement the programs because I, I can understand completely that resources are, are really needed to be able to, to do, um, to reach young people. But um, I encourage you to also partner with any civil society organizations that uh, want to engage with young people because they may have at least some seed funding to help work with you. Um, so those are just some ideas around that. I hope I answered um, that question. And it also related to another question around uh, sponsors. So um, yeah, I think, I think uh, broadening your scope can really help um, engage new funders, new donors. Um, and uh, I also, I, I noted the first question from Isofo about um, young people um, engaging in public awareness raising. So maybe it, it might be just helpful if I um, share just the next couple of slides because um, it actually addresses those questions. If that's okay, Daniel, and then I'll come back for another round of question, final questions, if that's okay. So- yeah, thank, you. thank you so much, Mimi. There's also an overwhelming demand uh, for you to share the presentation. Um, so many people <laughs> are requesting. <laughs> so yeah, I think we will discuss that, yeah. So uh, we'll share the recording too, guys. So um, um, let's... Uh... Yeah, let's do that. So we'll, uh, I'll maybe go through the last few slides and then check with you if there's any additional, because uh, I think it would be helpful to answer the first question around awareness raising, if that's okay. And what we expect young people can do. So shall I proceed? Yes, yes, Mimi. Sorry, my network uh, cut me short a bit. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you can proceed, please. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So um, I will definitely share the presentation as well. And uh, I wanted to highlight something very important here around um, the, the tracks, which is called the Tracking AMR Countries Self-Assessment Survey. Um, we do this on an annual basis and countries report on um, different indicators every year. And there's a question on awareness of AMR among school children and youth. And um, I am personally very um, passionate about this issue around schools being such a critical entry point for children to learn about AMR, to be able to ask questions in a safe environment and interact with their peers and their teachers. And it's a really excellent space to, to learn about AMR. Uh, but unfortunately, in the survey, and these results just came out um, about a week ago, it's clear that um, out of 166 countries that participated, 81% um, said there was no education on AMR. And therefore, 19% said, yes, they receive education. So we know this is a major gap. Um, and we're beginning, WHO is beginning some work with UNESCO and UNICEF to raise awareness um, around the visibility of AMR um, with policymakers in the education sector. So we're doing some advocacy around that. And then we're also developing um, some curriculum so that there's some standard information um, around AMR and health and education curricula. So this goes back to um, Isofo's question. There's a lot you can do as an individual. I wanted to start there because everyone has a, a role to play. Um, for all people everywhere, not just healthcare professionals. Um, we all need to be aware and have a basic understanding of AMR so that we can minimize um, spread. So you can take actions in your everyday life to prevent infection in the first place. You can practice and teach hand washing and personal hygiene. I have a, a five-year-old and a three-year-old, they're always <laughs> washing their hands. So this is something anyone at a very early age um, can do. And then uh, you can prepare food safely, uh, minimize close contact with others when they're sick, uh, keep up to date with your vaccinations and, and practice safer sex. So this all is helping to contribute to infection um, prevention. And um, these are some of the ideas that we mentioned in the WOW campaign guide. So um, you can promote the Go Blue campaign. So we're going to be wearing blue, uh, making our backgrounds blue like mine right now. We have a lot of assets to promote the, the campaign. And you can uh, remember to post and use the campaign hashtags uh, around hashtag AMR, hashtag WOW, hashtag antimicrobial resistance. 
and I encourage you to be creative. Um, and, you know, if not this year, next year, um, organize a photo poster competitions, make it very compelling. Um, don't make it like one sided, really have engage with young people. They have a lot of ideas and um, stories and um, so much. There's so much creativity. So really in all your activities, make it engaging for them to participate. And uh, yeah, I think that was it. I have a. Uh, are there any additional questions before I have one more closing slide? I'll hand it back to you, Daniel. Uh, not really, Mimi. We don't have any other questions. Just a lot of uh, warm appreciation uh, uh, for the very uh, informative session. So you can go ahead. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. And uh, I hope I get to see some of you in the future. And uh, I know through Daniel and your organization, I can... Uh, stay connected with all of you and, and I will be sure to send the, the slides and happy to answer any questions you have. If you want to, um, if you have, if you're looking at a tool and you, you want some advice or anything, I'm happy to provide that information for you. Um, and I wanted to close with just a quote again from Dr. Tedros that AMR is not a future crisis. It's here and now we need urgent action based on a shared global vision and narrative and ambitious targets to which we hold ourselves accountable. We can succeed, but only with concerted and coordinated action. And so, yeah, I'm really, uh, this is a really critical time for AMR because we have the UN high level meeting on AMR coming up next year. We have a really excellent um, campaign ahead with lots of events. So maybe I'll see you in some of the events over the next week. And I would just like to thank um, Students Against Superbugs Africa for having me here today. And uh, I look forward to hearing about your uh, events and your activities on, on social media. So thank you again and have a good weekend and restful uh, weekend before the big week of uh, campaigning. Thank you, thanks so much, Mimi, uh, for that. Sorry, I think my network is becoming unstable as we finish. Thank you so much, everyone for um attending and you know uh for listening in um and uh the reason as i said in the beginning for having this session is to prepare us very well i know uh, most of us have some good amazing activities that you're planning and if in case you don't have an activity that you're planning this has been a good challenge you know it's a good call to uh actually do something and as we say really you don't have to do so much uh even if you don't have the time, you know, uh, uh, for example, in your maybe class in um, or where you're training or where you're working, it's simple things such as just reading and getting to know more about EMR and sharing this with people, sharing with families actually goes uh, uh, way, 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 way impactful. And also let's keep ourselves updated so that at least we have good, uh, you know, knowledge. Let's attend the webinars. Let's, uh, you know, participate in small activities, for example, going blue and uh, other uh, other initiatives. And as you've said, so um, we hope that this information, we won't keep it to ourselves. Let's try as much as possible and cascade it to other people whom, uh, you know, we work with, people we interact with, and we'll share the recording and um, via email and also publicly. And also uh, we'll share with you, um, uh, the participants, uh, the, the presentation. So thanks so much, everyone. And uh, now I want to thank Mimi. Thanks so much, Mimi, for uh, making it today and, uh, you know, getting to educate us so much. I've also learned so much on my end, and I'm sure many of us have learned a lot too. And um, uh, it's something that, as Mimi said, we have really been thinking a lot around uh, capacitating, you know, uh, young people. So that at least even as we go about our activities, uh, you know, we are very well, um, we are very well uh, equipped and we are very well uh, uh, capacitated to actually do it. For some of us who started a bit earlier when, you know, AMR wasn't really in the spotlight, it was hard finding our way. So we had to stumble here and there, uh, but at least we don't want everyone to actually go through that. So, uh, you know, uh, let's start uh, very well energized, very well capacitated, having the skills, having the knowledge. And this helps a lot even when we are so seeking for resources, be it uh, financial resources, for example, funding, and be it technical resources. You know, how you package your work 
uh, helps a lot, even how you actually attract partners, you attract collaborations and other people whom you can work with. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I wish us a wonderful uh, evening and a wonderful World AMR Awareness Week ahead. I hope you are well energized and um, very ready. So I'll share my email in the, uh, in the chat as I can see some people are requesting. Thank you. Uh, so over to Mimi, maybe if you have any last words as we wind up. And also, thanks so much to my uh, mo uh, fellow moderators, Jatai and Jimmy. Uh, thanks so much for operating things uh, behind the scenes. Thank you so much. And over to you, Mimi, for any final remarks. Thanks so much, Daniel. And um, now that I've stopped sharing my screen, I can see all the lovely comments from the group and it's uh, very impressive to have uh, about 100 young people. Uh, it just shows how impactful your network is. And and uh, yeah, I look forward to um, continuing this conversation with you. And uh, just that I, I wish everyone the best of luck. And I hope you have fun in, in your WOW activities. And, you know, you... Um, you uh, reach out to not just uh, young people in your network, but the, the vulnerable young people, as was mentioned before, um, young people who are in the rural areas, young people who can't uh, uh, read. Um, we really wanna make sure every young person can be reached with information around um, AMR. And again, I would like to emphasize being simple, being concise. Uh, I know with AMR can be challenging, but uh, we can come up with fun ways to, um, promote our, our messages. And I really encourage you to, to use the, uh, the package of materials that we have in all of the six UN languages. And all of this can be found on our WHO uh, WOW campaign page. So uh, please, um, I encourage you to join the events, join, um, promote the, the package materials. And, um, and uh, thanks again for listening. It was really nice to, to interact with you today. Over from my side, Daniel. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for hosting as well. I forgot to mention at the end. Thank you for hosting this session and your team. Thank you, thank you thanks so much. And so for everyone, we'll uh, we'll uh, get back to you with an email uh, with the recording, also with the presentation, and also with some of the resources that Mimi has shared. So we'll kind of try to package them together. There are so many wonderful resources for those who are. Uh, uh, present at the beginning of the session, I shared some videos which uh, WHO has actually developed uh, that you can actually very simple uh, videos, you know, very self-explanatory, you know, that you can actually uh, use to raise awareness, you know, sharing within our statuses, our social media channels and the rest. So thanks so much, everyone. And I wish us a wonderful uh, evening and uh, a happy World AMR Awareness Week. Let's ensure that we give it our all and we do our best. And, you know, um, as Wangari Madai used to say, Wangari Madai is, uh, 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 we regard her as a hero in Kenya, you know, the hummingbug, that the little effort that each one of us does, you know, she used to give an analogy of a forest burning and the hummingbird just used to bring just a drop. And, uh, you know, out of that effort, many more animals then started contributing to the same. So let's be uh, hummingbirds and let's give it our best. Thanks so much, everyone, and do have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Daniel. Bye, everyone.